Hi folks, thanks for joining us at Brookside Gardens, Montgomery County's incomparable, award-winning 50-acre public display garden situated within Wheaton Regional Park. And welcome to another installment of the Food for the Heart and Nourishment for the Soul Sabbath School Lesson Series. Today is one of a two-part series here at Brookside Gardens. We will be exploring the two conservatories today and we'll be back in May for a tour of the many exterior gardens available. As I was preparing for our lesson study on the roots of Abraham, I read where after Terah, Abraham's father, passed in Haran, Abraham obeyed God and took his family and his nephew Lot and went to the land of Canaan. Genesis 12, 6 tells us, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Moreh. Now I became curious as to why this terebinth tree was important enough to be specifically mentioned and found the following information on the goodnewsforisrael.com website. Let's look into Shechem at the very place where Abram stopped, the terebinth tree of Moreh. For a start, the word for moray is in Hebrew, and it means to throw, to shoot, to teach, and became to mean a place where God spoke. And of course, this is where God spoke to Abram, in fact, appeared to him. And the tree was no ordinary tree. In fact, Moses said there was more than one. Deuteronomy 11, 29 through 30 tells us, now it shall be, when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of Jordan, toward the setting sun, in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal, beside the terebinth trees of Moray? Scholars say that the terebinth tree of Moray is an oak tree like the one behind me, only probably a lot bigger and older. Others say it is Pistachio palestina, which grows prolifically in the region and can grow quite large and in groves. Some scholars say that the Canaanites attributed trees to their teachers. It is most likely that this tree, amongst other trees, was a landmark. It was most likely a tree of great size and therefore great age probably having started growing from the end of the Great Flood 350 years earlier. An oak or pistachio seed being guided carefully by the hand of the Lord to float through the torrential and rapidly flowing floodwaters and finally coming to rest in the soil of that land between the two mountains of Gerizim and Ebal. And there it began its life to become the significant landmark that would draw Abram's eye as he entered the land and cause him to stop and pitch his tent. Here at this ancient landmark, the Lord would appear to Abram. Abram would build an altar under its massive branches to mark the ground as holy and special. It was both a landmark and a faith mark. 175 years later, Jacob would come and buy the land and dig a well and settle here. He would bury all the foreign idols at the base of this tree, at the place of Abram's altar. It too was a faith mark. Jacob's sons would herd their sheep near this familiar landscape icon and sell Joseph into slavery, so sealing God's plan to save them from a future famine, and so preserve the nation and fulfill his covenant with Abram. Hundreds of years later, Joshua would return with a nation, now millions of people, descendants of Jacob and to this very spot. Here the nation declared allegiance to the Lord. He put a great stone there as a further landmark and a faith mark. Joseph's bones were buried at the place where the old tree stood, a faith mark. Abimelech would be declared the first king of Israel here under the terebinth tree. Rehoboam would come to the tree to be declared king over Israel. Jeroboam would make this site where this great tree once stood his first capital of the new northern kingdom of Israel. And finally, Jesus would speak to a Gentile Samaritan woman here and declare himself the Messiah to her, so declaring that the covenant was not just to the physical sons of Abram, but to all who would believe on him as the Messiah. 
The great old landmark, the Terebinth Tree of Moray, it was a mighty faith mark provided by the Lord to the nation of Israel and to the future spiritual sons of Abram. Now with this background, let's turn our attention to this week's lesson, study number six, The Roots of Abraham. Welcome back. Shabbat Shalom. Happy Sabbath and welcome to this quarter's topic, Genesis. And this week's Sabbath school lesson study number six, The Roots of Abraham. It is Friday, April 29, 2022, here at our production studio in Hampstead, Maryland. And today was mostly sunny uh, with temperatures reaching 57 degrees. Tomorrow on Sabbath, we're looking at plenty of sunshine and a temperature of 66. Looking forward to that. And first of all, I am so thankful that our Creator has brought us through this past work week and blessed us with the Sabbath where we can come together and to worship Him and learn more of His will for us. Uh, of course, it's great to see our panel and Sabbath School class members with us this evening. Carrie and Alfredo, it's good to see you. How things been since we were together on Wednesday down at Brookside Gardens uh, filming uh, uh, the uh, conservatories. Wonderful, sir. Excellent. Yep. Praise the Lord. Everything's been wonderful. Terrific. Terrific. Um, we are seem to be missing Lawrence uh, this week, uh, but we do have our our teachers uh, here, and so glad to to see all of you. Um, and of course, uh, with our walk-up tune here for Harold Green. Harold, how are you doing this week? How is Kimar? And have you prepared your gardens and done any planting yet? It's too early to, to plant, but I have tilled the garden under. I, I tilled it over three three times now. So it's okay. it's ready. All we need is, is enough sunshine to keep to warm up the ground. Yep. And a promise of no freeze. Yeah, well, I, I, you say that the it's it's early to plant. Well, the weeds are having no problem in my property here, <laughs> uh, getting getting going. Uh, but uh, at any rate, <laughs> Ella, it's good to see you back. You've been missing for a couple of weeks. We're glad to have you back. How, how are things with you? I've been really good. I've been really busy. Uh, we've had a lot of stuff going on at our church and just a lot of other things with school. Um, Last night was the recital for all of my students. I have 17 music students, and we had a recital last night, and it was really nice. So God has been good. I've been busy, but I'm happy to be here. Good. We're happy happy to have you. And, of course, uh, next in the lineup is the judge uh, from down in Murphy, North Carolina. Rudy Beta, how are things down there? I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, uh, things are going well. A um, lot of stuff going on, uh, but uh, it's, it's a good time of year. And you had a, a good experience, one that I uh, almost have never experienced, which is a good golf day. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, now, now that you mentioned that, it, it was a good golf day. <laughs> good golf day for me is finding a few uh, lost balls in the woods while I'm looking for my lost ball. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much it. At any rate, uh, Rudy, you, uh, of course, are going to start us off uh, in our Sabbath school lesson this week. So if you could uh, start us off with prayer, that'd be terrific. All right. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, um, we come to uh, the close of this work week and the beginning of the Sabbath. Uh, we want to praise you and thank you for your care and guidance through the week, for your uh, watch care. And, and we know that you are leading us and helping us uh, because we love you. And we also thank you for the Sabbath uh, that has come, a day of rest and gladness. 
And, and so uh, as we have opportunity on this Friday evening, Sabbath evening to um, open your word and to study together um, in your holy word uh, about the great patriarchs uh, and specifically Abraham this week. We pray your blessing upon our meeting and, and those who are leading out and we pray that all of us will gain from this study. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So um, to, to, to start us off, um, I invite you to turn to uh, chapter 12 of Genesis. And uh, <clears throat> just to, to set a little background to, to what's going on in this chapter, um, Abram is the central character uh, of this story. And he, at, at the beginning of this story, was living in Ur of the Chaldeans. And, and um, this was a highly civilized culture of Semitic tribes uh, with it, it great advances in, in many things, including science and learning, uh, among other things. And, and it was an affluent culture. Uh, much business was conducted there. And Abram, uh, coming from that Semitic culture, uh, as you would expect, had many friends and family members there living in, with him or near him. Uh, and so uh, this is where we begin. And it's amazing to me um, we learn from, from our study that, that Abram had a relationship with the Lord, uh, but he was living in, in what was mainly a pagan culture. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a mystery as to how uh, the Lord uh, brought him into a relationship um, but, but he did, had a, he had a strong relationship and belief in, in the Lord. And so that's where we are. Um, and so I want to go through the first three verses here. Uh, this is the call that the Lord made to Abram. Uh, he says, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and all the families of the earth will be blessed. So that was the call that went out to Abram from the Lord. And, and so his this call called him to go to a place that he did not know uh to a culture he did not know and to leave his family and his and his friends so instead of living among related and highly civilized semitic tribes he would be sojourning among a racially different a hemitic culture uh, of materially lower, a materially lower culture, um, less education, less culture. Um, and, and so that's, that was his choice. And that's where God asked him to go. And in, and in verse three, this assurance that the Lord gives him was really a pledge of friendship from the Lord, uh, of the a highest pledge of friendship and favor that the Lord could bestow upon him. And, and so the question is, did he respond? And, and did he agree to, to this call by the Lord? Well, we, we learned that he did. Continuing here, it says, to, so Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. 
Now, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. So, finding himself in a, as an alien amidst a strange people, uh, Abram could not regard the land as his own and actually take possession of it yet. This he could do only by faith. And Hebrews 11 talks about this faith that led him to, to make this choice and to follow this command and go into this strange culture. Um, Hebrews 11, I'm going to read verse 9. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Then going down to verse 13, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So Abram's faith is what was the driving force here that, that motivated him to, to follow this command and to go into this strange land, the land of Canaan the promised land. Uh, now, in the introduction, um, Don talked about verse 6 here, um, which says that Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to, to the oak of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. Well, oak can also be translated as terebinth, uh, the King James calls this the plain of Moray, but that's a, that's really a, not an accurate translation. Uh, the the Hebrew word here is Elon, and literally that means a great tree. So uh, the Revised Standard Version calls it an oak tree, uh, and, and so does the New American Standard but uh, it can also be translated as a terebinth tree. And Don gave us a lot of information that I'm not gonna repeat, but it, it was good stuff, good information about this very famous site. Um, so, um, is my sound still good? Yes. Okay. So in verse seven, after reaching this point, it says that the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. So the Lord appears now and reassures him. And, and I'm sure that he needed reassurance to know that, that he was doing, he was following the Lord's leading in, in this situation. And it says that um, he built an altar there to the Lord, uh, who had appeared to him to commemorate that event. And, you know, as you go on and study um, the sojourn of Abram in Canaan, he erected an altar wherever he pitched his tent. And he conducted public worship there for the members of his household and for the pagans living nearby. And, and so um, this was a, a means, if you will, of educating the pagan people of that country about the Lord. Uh, he, was a, he was a powerful witness to them. And his altars... Um, dotted the, the, the Palestinian countryside, and they became memorials to the one true God. 
And, and so the Canaanites, whose iniquity was not yet full, were made acquainted with the creator of the universe. And by Abram's precept and example were called upon to discard their idols and to worship him, to worship the creator. Uh, verse 9 says that Abram sojourned, journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. Um, the Negev uh, is, uh, the King James says, toward the south. Uh, the Negev is actually the Hebrew word for that area. And this was a semi-arid country south of the mountains, which is later later times belonged to judah and with its sparse population and wide open spaces and grazing land the negev seemed to him to be more suitable and so that's where he chose to go so um and continuing there it, it says that there was a famine in the land so that abram went down to egypt to sojourn there for the famine was severe or great in the land. Uh, we're not told the cause of the famine, uh, but because there was a famine, uh, he had to leave that country and go to Egypt uh, because apparently there was food available in Egypt. Not, so, the first, not, not the not the first well that may be the first time we heard about that but we know that uh, for some reason Egypt uh, was able to have food when some of the other outlying countries didn't and yes we, we know about with Joseph uh, how that worked out yes and and Egypt was a strong as a, was a heavy producer of of uh, food crops uh, at that time all based on the Nile based on the Nile, you're correct. Uh, although the, the Nile Delta area was very rich uh, soil and allowed a lot of farming in that area. Um, so um, something happened in Egypt that's interesting, uh, not necessarily good, but it's interesting. Uh, you know, we, we've talked before in, in, the, in our lesson studies about uh, the fact that um, there are great people in the Bible who were strong uh, patriarchs, uh, champions for the Lord. And Abram was certainly one of those people. Uh, but, but when scripture was written and inspired, uh, the Lord did not withhold from us the mistakes made by those patriarchs. And Abram made one of those mistakes. Um, he, he failed to rely upon the Lord here. Um, so let's read about this experience. Um, it says that when he came near to Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, see now, I know you are a beautiful woman. Now, uh, she was middle-aged, by the way, uh, at this time. I think about 50, 60 in that range. Um, but, but apparently still a very beautiful woman. I, I, you can only imagine how beautiful she was in her youth, and, and, but she's still beautiful. But that's concerning to him because he knows something about the the Egyptian culture, and he is there as a guest of Egypt and his, and his household and his family, uh, but subject to the whims of the officials in Egypt, notably the Pharaoh. So um, he tells her, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. They will kill me, but they will let you live. Now, his fears are probably well-founded uh, here. Under normal circumstances, uh, with anybody else, that's probably what would have happened. 
if 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 the if the pharaoh desired this woman uh he would not have hesitated to kill the husband so that he could have her and and so that's what he's trying to avoid uh and i'm not justifying what he did but I, i'm just explaining to you from a human standpoint why he did it uh it says that please say telling her that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that i may live on account of you well um just so you know um she actually was his half sister he married his half sister and and so he felt justified in asking her to tell this half truth half sister half truth <laughs> uh, to pass herself off as his sister and and so that was the plan and that's what they did and and just as he suspected uh it says that when he came into egypt the egyptians saw that this woman was very beautiful and pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to pharaoh and the woman was taken into pharaoh's house so there you go just as he expected it happened therefore he treated abram well for her sake and now this is this next part is important that he gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels a huge amount of livestock and servants he's already rich he already has a large household and many animals and and here pharaoh is giving him much more um, and so he becomes richer uh, because of the, the presence that Pharaoh gives to him. Um, but the Lord intervenes. The Lord intervenes, verse 17. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Um, I want to I want to read a text here. Kind of keep your finger here, but but um, if you go to second Second Timothy two, give me a minute here to uh, get there. Second Timothy two, verse thirteen says, "Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Um, That's not the text I wanted. But let me just comment uh, here uh, about this. Um, you probably have found, as, as I have found, um, that there are times when the Lord intervenes in the lives of of his of his faithful followers uh of his of his people uh to help them when they really don't deserve it uh when they haven't really gone to him to ask him for help did do you see any record here where abram asked the lord for help in this situation 
no. or for a, or for a council. However, uh, this this verse that you told us to go to actually fits that purpose. Well, where is read that verse for me, Don? Okay, yeah, uh, this is a uh, Second Timothy uh, two thirteen. It says, "If we are faithless, he remains faithful." He can. There we go. Yeah, that's himself. what I was going to get to. So there it is. And and I've I have experienced that. I'm just telling you, looking back over my life, I can tell you of of, of sit times in my life when when I wasn't necessarily faithful to the Lord, where I was wandering, going down my own road, uh, or doing things that really were not proper for me to be doing. But but nonetheless, I can tell you that there were times where God intervened to help me uh, when I did not expect it, didn't he, he did not even know that I was in danger. And, and, and only with hindsight can I look back on those times and see where, where God did marvelous things for me. I didn't deserve those things. And, and so he does the same thing here uh, for Abram. God is faithful when we are not faithful. Um, so it's just, it, it tells you about, about the character of the Lord. Um, we don't deserve, we don't deserve the things that the Lord does for us. Um, I mean, let's be honest about it. Well, we deserve something, but not that. <laughs> well, I'm just glad, I'm just glad that, that I have uh, a faithful Lord. Uh, great is his faithfulness. We sing about that. And, and, and who is, uh, where would I be? Where would I be without that? Where would Abram be without it here? Uh, and, and so, because if, if God had not intervened, uh, she would have become Pharaoh's wife uh, here. A great sin would have been committed uh, by Pharaoh, by her, by Abram, by everybody involved here. Um, and, and the Lord stopped it. Um, and, and so, and I don't know, I don't know what kind of plagues came on Pharaoh's house, possibly great sickness, illness struck members of his family, uh, maybe even him, uh, or other things. Uh, but it certainly put a, a, a screeching halt to his plans. And, and so he called, he calls Abram in and uh, he says, um, and by the way, um, I just want to say something here. Um, about Pharaoh. Um, I mean, he really conducted himself um, in, in a way that's, that's surprising to me. Uh, he says to Abram, what is this you have done to me? And why did you not tell me she was your wife? Now, I don't know how he learned that, but he learned that. Uh, maybe the Lord told him in a dream, or maybe he inquired more and learned that she was actually his wife. And so that's a good question. Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. How about that? Um, so, um, and it's interesting. Remember all those, all those gifts that he had given to him? All the animals? the livestock, the servants, he made him rich. He could take all that stuff with him. Pharaoh didn't take the gifts back. He says, because you lied to me, I'm taking all that stuff back that I gave to you. Uh, you acquired that uh, with untruthfulness and you don't deserve it. So 
Yeah. Done. Maybe if I could just remark on that, that um, it that plan of taking it back never occurred to me. Not he was so fearful of the uh, whatever it was that that created this disease for him and his family and others uh, that he didn't want anything that they had touched uh, back again. Uh, he wanted them out of the country. And as a matter of fact, rules, laws were set at that point that lasted for centuries about allowing the Semitic uh, 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 sheep herders and things from coming into Egypt. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and he also recognized that I don't know how much he knew about the Lord, but he learned about the Lord. And, and, and so he feared the Lord here. I mean, in real fear uh, and, and the Lord's displeasure. And so he did not dare to deal harshly with Abram. Uh, and, and so I think that's, that's probably a big part of the reason why he said, just go take all this stuff and go. It's interesting to me that uh, as we read this story, uh, Abram came into Egypt fearing for his life and, 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 and scheming. And what he ended up doing is giving Pharaoh a legal right to actually take his life because he lied to the, he lied to the king, the Pharaoh. He, he deceived him. And, and, and for any other monarch would have, would have punished him for, for the deception with his life. And, uh, and, and so Abram actually did uh, what he caused uh, the right to do what he was afraid of, and that's the life. So exactly. yes, Pharaoh showed grace and, and and, uh, and no doubt it was uh, out of fear and, and respect for whatever deity was, was in charge of Abram's life. Yes, yes. Um, so, um, and it says, just to finish it, verse 20, Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away and with his wife and all that belonged to him, all that belonged to him. So, indirectly, now, now tell me if I'm misreading this, but indirectly, the Lord continues to bless Abram in spite of his actions because he's making him richer. What do you think? Yeah, uh, provided for his future needs and the for his future needs, and and he was to become a great man, and and so the Lord knew that he would need these things to establish a nation there. Uh, he was he was the beginning of it. He was the father of of that nation. He also God also knew he was going to need a lot of people in his tribe. Uh, in the future to go back to go and get lot <laughs> back <laughs> well he actually had it he had a small army yeah. so um yeah alfredo so you would think that abraham would learn from this lesson from all the blessings that god has given him even though he made this mistake but in genesis 20 he does the same thing again with his with sarah isn't that interesting yeah yeah uh, yep. we'll we'll study about that uh, coming up but yeah you're correct yep. um he he goes right back into the same pit yeah repeating sin yeah. Who, who does that remind us of uh providing, I don't providing we have a, a mirror nearby <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't know yeah it's i guess it's human nature huh um okay so um let's let's get into chapter 13 here um and, and we have another interesting story here uh in in chapter 13 so um 
he leaves Egypt, he goes to the, back to the Negev, and he and his wife and all that belonged to him, and Lot was with him. And, and it says that he was very rich in livestock and in silver and in gold. Um, and, and so um, he camps there and, and uh, builds an altar and, and Lot was with him. And Lot also had accumulated apparently a lot of animals, a lot of flocks. And so he had to have servants, shepherds to take care of those flocks. And, and so uh, verse six says that the land could not support them. The land could not sustain them. There were too many uh, while they dwelled together and, and their possessions were so great that they were not able to continue together. And, and there, that strife developed between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And uh, so all that, remember, they're in a, still in a strange land with the Canaanites dwelling around them. Uh, and, and so it's, it's not a good thing for, for the Canaanites dwelling around them to see the strife and, and bickering going on among their families, among their servants. And so Abram decides something has to be done. And, and so he says to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is it not the whole land, is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If, if to the left, then I will go to the right. Or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Now, now think about this. Lot was there at the goodwill of Abram. Abram was the leader. Abram was the patriarch. Abram was the person that God had sent on this mission. And, and Lot just went along. And, and so uh, Abram, in this offer to Lot, displayed a generosity of spirit, a nobility of mind, um, that um, is rare. Uh, his character uh, speaks loudly here uh, by, this, by this generous offer that he makes to Lot. Uh, Lot didn't deserve this, but he sure took advantage of it. Uh, because it says that Lot looked around and, and he looks at the Valley of Jordan and, and it's lush, uh, good soil, lots of water. Um, the garden, like the garden of the Lord, it says. And so that's where he decides to go and take all his herds and flocks with him. Uh, the best, he chose the best, the choice part for himself. Um, and, and so he journeys on eastward, and they separate, and, and Abram allows him to make that choice. No disagreement, no criticism from Abram, again, displaying his character um, here. And uh, Abram settled uh, in the land of Canaan while Lot settled in the cities of the valley, and he moved his tent near to a city called Sodom that was there. Now, we're going to hear a lot more about Sodom coming up, but just, just as a, a point here, and, and we know that eventually he and his family just moved into Sodom, into the city, and lived there in, in that pagan culture. Um, so, and, and it says that the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord, but he still chose to live there. He still settled there. I mean, where, where is the judgment? Where does Lot display good judgment anywhere here? Do you see anywhere? Um, 
what well, the well, I I I find it very difficult to believe that with children daughters he had daughters young daughters why he would move his family into the city and remain there uh, with all the stuff that was going on right in front of him on the streets it just is amazing to me uh, it, sh- it shows you how how I, I guess it happens to him like it happens to so many people when when they're, they're when they're doing well when, when they're thriving uh, when they're rich uh, when they become increased with this world's goods and and, and live in a in a in a, in a highly um, uh, educated culture um, that they just kind of get carried away with all of it and, and lose their way. I, I think there's also a fact that Lot was young. We don't really know his age, but, but Lot was remembers where they came from. And you you described Ur the Chaldees uh, well as as very civilized. It was um, they 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 lived as stationary. They had a home there. And and Abe, following with Abraham, they're 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 tent dwellers. They're they're nomads, no, nomadic life. And Lot, no doubt, um, going down and seeing the city of of, of Sodom, and no doubt it it was uh, a lot more uh, affluent uh, type of place, and 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 a, and a chance for him to to build a house or buy a house or gain something with stability. I, I think it's a natural human draw for Lot, and and he over, it, it, which forced him to to blind his eyes to the to the sin and 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 uh, go into it. And I think there's spiritual lesson there for us. This is we're we're nomads in this land, and and you know we need to keep our eyes on the 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 home coming, for and not be uh, getting focusing on on the here and now yeah good point good point and and would you say harold that that he had spiritual blinders well that's a good way of saying what i was trying to describe yes yeah yeah so um but after after lot moves away the lord comes down again to have a conversation with abram uh, I think the Lord was proud of him here um, and of the character that he showed. And, and, and he, he, he reassures him again. Verse 14, he says, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which you see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and its breadth, and I will give it to you. Isn't that a grand promise from the Lord here at a time when he probably needed it again? Uh, Renewing the, the pledge that the Lord had made to him, the covenant that he had made with him again. Yes. Um, and then finally, in verse 18, it says that Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Well, again, um, the, um, the King James uh, misinterprets and, and calls it a plain. But it's not a plain. It's it's actually oaks plural, or terebinth trees plural. This was a grove of trees, uh, as as is clear from the Hebrew, and this grove of trees belonged to an Amorite chieftain named Mamre, and thus it's it's the oaks of Mamre that where he came and and established his camp. And this, this Mamre 
later became his friend and his ally. Um, and so um, I think, now I'm just using a little conjecture here, but I believe that, that this, because of this prominent chieftain of the Amorites through his friendship with Abram came to know about the Lord, a lot about the Lord. And if he learned, then the people uh, in his kingdom would have learned. And, and, and God uses friendship and relationships among people in marvelous ways. I believe that that's one of the strongest ways that we can, we can witness to people who don't know the Lord through, through friendships and relationships with them. So, Rudy, you, back to your point about um, that you think that it was misnamed as, as a plane. Um, earlier uh, in, in, the, in the video uh, that, that preceded, um, I was talking about the, where this terebinth tree or trees were, and it was between two mountains, uh, Gerizim and Ebal, and those two mountains were close enough that later on, the tribes of Israel were placed uh, half of them on one mountain, half on the other, and they were able to shout across to each other. So this is probably more like a valley in between. Yeah, yeah, that that it was like a natural amphitheater. Mm -hmm. And and you're right, sound could carry from from one mountain to another. Yeah, uh, it became a central place. It became an important place. Yep. But right now, it's owned by the Amorites. And, and through the good graces of his friend, his new friend, Mamre, he was allowed to, to settle there. Uh, so you can see, I mean, the Lord is directing in all of this. The Lord is helping him every step of the way. The Lord is blessing him uh, because of his faith and rewarding his faith. So um, that's all I have to tell you. Uh, unless somebody would like to make some more comments, the uh, the class members really haven't had too much to say. So, uh, what do you think? By the way, welcome, uh, Lawrence. Uh, we haven't said hi to you yet. <laughs> my apologies. Uh, I I came home a little early to get uh, all my yard work uh, done, and I got stuck in the woods with uh, d d dumping a load of. Uh, uh, branches and it was just and then I all of a sudden I look at the clock oh my gosh I, I mean I still have sap all over my hands and I <laughs> kind of need to turn everything on and quickly got online and I was like I made it so I'm happy thank you um no I'm, again my apologies for being a little late no we're glad you showed up yes <laughs> even with sap on your hands yes <laughs> the pages are sticking on me so a little bit so <laughs> good I had a thought before we move into the next lesson. There was one thought, one point, I really actually enjoyed the whole lesson, but there was one point that I had sort of thought about when I had read this chapter a little while ago, and then you pulled on it a little bit, Mr. Rudy, um, where, or maybe it was Mr. Harold, both of you, I don't remember, but where you talked about how everywhere Abraham went, he built an altar and he worshiped God. And I thought that was really neat. And in my own studies previously, when I was reading this, it really hit me that that is what we should be doing in every area of our lives is every time we're wanting to move, maybe physically or move to a different area of our lives, a new job or everything every day to go before the altar, to go before God and to call upon him. So I thought that was a very interesting point because Abraham did it very physically, but it's something that we also should be doing today. So I thought I thought that was really interesting. I'm glad you uh, brought that out. Yeah, yeah, it is. And you're right. I mean, spiritually, we don't build altars anymore, but we can spiritually do the same thing, can't we? Yeah. And, and so and using that, using that symbol uh, or that metaphor, we can still do that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a real good point. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. So, um, Ella, I guess you're you're the you're in charge now. So, all right. So, 
For um, Wednesday's lesson, we are getting into chapter 14 of Genesis. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the verses. So the first five or the first 11 verses, we're talking about the first war that's narrated in scriptures. And I'm not going to read through all of the verses because I cannot say all of the names properly that are listed there. So we're going to talk about them so I don't have to say them and mess them all up. But in the first five verses, we read about the five, uh, con not countries, sorry, five armies, including Sodom and Gomorrah that are together. And these countries, I keep saying countries, sorry. And these armies have um, come together. And in verse four, it says, 12 years they served Chedolamar, and in the 13th year, they rebelled. So these, uh, oh my goodness, these armies rebelled against the four armies from Mesopotamia and Persia. And so during this time, Abraham's in his land, and this is happening. And this is a big trusting point for Abraham to see these, to see this happening. And I can see him or at least for me, if I was Abraham, I could see him being like, okay, God, you put me here and you promised all of these things. And now there's a war going on like right here. So what do you want me to do? But he pulls on to his faith and that character that we were just seeing. And he's trusting in God. He's following what God wants him to. And he's not really getting involved that scripture tells us very much until verse 12 where it says they took lot abram's brother abram's brother's son who dwelt in sodom and his goods and departed and so here i want to share with you a quote from the lesson from patriarchs and prophets which says abraham dwelling in peace in the oak trees of mamre learned from one of the fugitives the story of the battle and the calamity that had befallen his nephew. He had cherished no unkind memory of Lot's ingratitude. All his affection for him was awakened and he determined that he should be rescued. Seeking first of all divine counsel, Abraham prepared for war. So here um, Ellen White's telling us that he, uh, first of all, had divine counsel. He sought God, which is better. And so it looks like he learned something from his previous experiences, even though we see later he made more mistakes again. But And he's following God and asking him. And so he goes and he takes um, the army. So let's go ahead and read verses 13 through 17. Um, let's see. Mr. Dom, would you be willing to read that for us? Sure. Oh, and, and so 13 through 17 uh, in the New King James Version. Uh, then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner. And they were allies with Abram. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. After his return from the defeat of Cheder Laamor, Laamor and the kings who were with him. Thank you. So we he see here that Abraham was victorious against these armies, which normally you would be considered... Um, impossible and this is all through god and through how abraham is trusting him in these circumstances and he sought god's counsel before going and to these to this battle so 
I think it's really interesting when looking at these, uh, when this, these verses, we saw earlier how Lot, one, how Lot chose the best of the best, and he chose it for himself, wanting to be completely in control, and he ended up being the prisoner who had to be set free. Abraham chose the not as appealing land, and yet he was when he trusted in God, he was victorious. So this is really a really interesting part point for our lives is sometimes when it feels like God's not leading us to the most appealing worldly thing, he's actually leading us into the best thing for for everything, for leading up to heaven. So I'd like to pull some parallels with this in the New Testament, but before I do that, does anyone have any thoughts before I move forward? Mr. Rudy. Just a short one. Um, have you thought about, um, I don't know how many soldiers um, were in these um, armies that had taken Sodom and Gomorrah and, and all the people captive and carried away all these goods and had a lot. I don't know, but but I'm guessing if, if there were four kings and each one was from a large city, they had they must have had thousands of men, several thousands of men in their armies. Uh, and, and so and their armies were strong enough to defeat these other cities, these other armies. And, and, and so Abram goes out with 318 men. He says he had 318 trained men against these thousands of men. And I thought about Gideon and the story of Gideon, um, how I, where the, I mean, the Midianites had, had many, many thousands of men. And, and the Lord pairs his army down to 300. And he says, okay, it's the right size now. I, I, can, I can do this, but I don't want you to take credit uh, and thinking you did it. I want you to understand that I did it. And, and so nobody can claim that 300 men could do this without the Lord intervening and doing it. And then the same thing in this case, nobody could say that Abram with 318 men could do this unless the Lord intervened. There's so, so many striking parallels between those two stories. Yeah, definitely. Mr. Don? Um, I just like to point out here uh, mm -hmm. at, at, the, at the base, at the bottom of Wednesday's lesson, uh, it uh, has a, 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 a little blurb here from Ellen White's Patriarchs and Prophets on page 135. And it talks about uh, what you said about uh, Abraham not uh, having any uh, uh, unkind memories of lots. But in the next paragraph below that, it says, Abram does not confront the whole coalition. It in what must have been a quick and nocturnal commando operation, he attacks only the camp where Lot was held prisoner. Lot is saved, thus this faithful man of God also showed great courage and fortitude. Uh, no doubt his influence in the region grew and people saw the kind of man he was and learned something more of the God whom he served. I am guessing that uh, even though there were four kings and thousands of them, that after they had attacked and won and were taking their goods back that they split up and divided going back to their own countries. And Abraham was able to catch the ones that had lot. And so then did not confront all of this whole group together. Well, but neither, neither did Gideon. And neither did Gideon. I mean, if, you, if you want to make a point of that, neither did Gideon. No. He used strategy uh to do what he did to, to accomplish his purposes uh he went at night and then you know they they shouted and used pictures of light uh and put them to, to to route without actually attacking them physically so but again that was under the lord's instructions right yeah thank you thank you both for that as you were uh starting to talk into my mind came gideon and then you brought him in i was like oh yay so I was really glad for that. And it is a really cool story. I'm going to have to read more and uh, go study more of the parallels between the two because there are a lot. I love seeing the parallels between the different stories. So from one of the points I had made before about how 
when we let God guide you, you are victorious. There was a point in the teacher's selection of the lesson that I thought was interesting and in that they brought out in the New Testament. So looking at the Beatitudes. Um, so if we look at Matthew chapter five, verses five and six, it says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. And I think this is where Abraham was at this point. When we are willing to be meek or humble and let God use us, he will give us the victory. And so I thought that was a really interesting point because Jesus is talking about this and it's been showed in the New Testament hundreds of years, sorry, Old Testament hundreds of years earlier. So I thought that was very interesting. So the last part of the lesson says, what kind of influence do our actions have on others? What kind of message are we sending about our faith by our actions? So I'm gonna open that up to the panel and then I'll provide my thoughts. Well, I, you, you hear it said that our actions speak louder than words. And I think that, um, this is an example of that. Abraham's actions and, and how he, he came in and rescued and, and uh, he may have focused uh, on, on lots, the, the group that, that, that were lot in his family was. But obviously when you when you see the rest of the story that's read, uh, there were there was quite a number that he rescued outside of Lot's family. Uh, yeah. and, and so, uh, but and, and Abraham, no doubt, uh, by by his act of mercy and and, and act of, of rescuing, spoke spoke a, a lot for for not only his character but the character of his God. Yes, definitely. And I think as well, when we're looking at it, when you have someone who tells you something and is telling you these different things it's really nice to have the wisdom, but when you see that person living it, it gives you even more of a respect for them. And I think that's what the people had for Abraham as Mr. Don was uh, reading at the end portion of the lesson afterwards. And like you said, actions speak louder than words. And so that is what we're called to be today. When I was thinking about these questions, the verses that came to mind were also in Matthew chapter five verses, 14 um verse 14 you are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden so for us our actions our actions show people what we believe and so are we being a light are we being a bright light or are we joining in the darkness so i think that's a really interesting point and there are some really great lessons including this one that we can learn from abraham so does anyone have any other, oh, Mr. Don? Um, th here's, a, here's a point that, uh, you know, I didn't think about until I looked at these uh, five kings that were attacked by the other four kings. And if you look, uh, you may not be able to pronounce the king's names, but what you can see is the cities that it talks about. And it is uh, uh, Sodom, mm -hmm. Gomorrah, uh, Adma, Zeboim, uh, and 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 uh, Zoar. These five cities, by the way, are all on the uh, border of Canaan, and they're by uh, and and all five of those cities. Later on, we find out were destroyed by God. All of them. So, was this attack by these other four kings? A warning from God. In other words, you you're sinning, and here I'm going to I'm going to punish you here now. And if you don't turn around and figure this out, then I'm going to totally destroy you. It's the exact same five cities that we find uh, where all, all of them had the same result as Sodom and Gomorrah. I I, I believe you 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 brought up a, a, a good point, and 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 they by being rescued by Abraham coming and rescuing them and uh, 
uh, it, it was another way of, of God working on them. You know, we 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 hear uh, have God um, telling Abraham later that that his his descendants will will uh, will go back down to Egypt, and 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 it be, it be and he's and it will be a while before they go back into Canaan and and take the land. And because of the Amorites, are he's not done with them yet. He, they, they haven't, and and so God is working on them all along through Abraham's ex, uh, example, as you've been talking, Ella, uh, and 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 as Don is pointing out, yeah, I think God's still working on them until until their time is up. Yeah, and that is really amazing showing his mercy considering from where they were in that situation giving them warnings sending them people that can be that example and then for them still to continue that shows everyone around that they had rejected him and so i think today that is for us is that we are seeking him and that we can be witnesses and examples to those around us just like abraham was so does anyone else have any other thoughts or comments? No. Okay. Well then, Mr. Harold, I will give it to you. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and, and um, to get into the Thursday's lesson, it's, we, we, we take the uh, last part of, of, of the rest of the Genesis 14, but to, to, to set the stage that I'd like us to look at, I, I, I'd like, Carrie, could I get you to read uh, Genesis 14? And I'd like us to start with verse 17. And then I'd like you to skip over and, and read verses 21 to 24. So this is, this takes place after Abram uh, has, has rescued Lot. And, and 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 he's they're they're coming back home, so so you can put yourself in 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 the in the frame of mind that that they're celebrating, they're they're excited because they they've been successful. God has definitely been with them, and then we start with verse seventeen. Okay, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Cheradolamer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sebeb, which is the king's dale. And then you said 21 through 24? Yes, please. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, that most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latcher, and that I will not take anything that is thine. Least thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me. Anir, Eshal, and Mamre, let them take their portion. All right. So we have we have uh, the in Genesis the story of of, of the king of Sodom coming uh, to meet them, and, uh, and 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 being thankful. Now, what has the king of Sodom been doing just prior to this? Did did you catch it? Uh, and, 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 and 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 earlier in this in the story. Well, he was rebelling for one thing. Okay, he, he he had been he had rebelled and didn't want to pay tribute, and that's what he, uh, he basically ca caused the the battle, the the, the, the raid. And the, but but at, in their fight, if you go back up to, uh, my eyes are going to fall on it. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 verse ten, I believe it is. As they're fighting, now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. So, so the battle wasn't going well, and, and they ran scared. 
At least that's how I read it. Um, some fell there and the remainder fled to the mountains. So the king of Sodom had been part of the battle. He, 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 he ran scared, he headed, headed for the mountains. And, um, and now Abram has rescued uh, his, the people and, and the king of Sodom is coming back very thankful. Uh, very, uh, and and uh, we we see this story uh, as it is completed here. Um, but anyway, just a side note there with, uh, about what had happened to the king. The the Moses when he wrote Genesis does a very interesting thing, because as you as Carrie read for us, this this is sounds like. Uh, a, 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 that we have something just inserted right in the middle. Something interrupts the flow of the story with verses 18 through 20. Uh, Lawrence, could you read uh, verses 18 through 20? Keep in mind that, that the king of Sodom comes up and then, then Lawrence's part, part happens. Okay. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a teeth of all. Now the king of Saddam. Oh, that, that's oh. it. Now, okay. that, 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 that was covered and, and, and so we have oh, yeah. inserted right in the middle of something interrupts this, the story. And that's the, the king of, 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 of Salem or, or Melchizedek uh, enters the story and, 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 he, and he does this. He, he, he uh, pr pronounces a blessing and, and he, and he pl blesses Abram uh, uh, and he blesses the God of Abraham, Abram. So uh, now why as I studied this, the, the thing that jumped out at me is why this interruption in the flow of the story. A anyone have any ideas or did, did you notice this interruption? The king of Sodom comes in and he doesn't talk until after the Melchizedek portion. Uh, hmm. uh, so I, I, I did some study and, and what I read and what, I, what I've what i tried to fit in my mind, uh, th there are, are a couple of things and, and chances are it's, a, it's at least maybe a mixture of, of more than one why Moses wrote it this way. Obviously God, uh, the spirit uh, uh, enlightened him as to what to write, but no doubt this is how it took place. The king of, uh, of, of Sodom came in and was interrupted. The fact now, the fact that the king of Sodom uh, uh, stood back and let this 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 blessing and, and all take place um, says something about the king of Sodom's understanding of who this Melchizedek was. He he, he the only way that that he would have done st step back like this would be if he had high respect for the king of, of Salem and, and, and actually uh, placed his, value, his, his uh, level of importance above, above his own. Um, and uh, that, that's interesting because we know nothing until this en entrance of, of the Melchizedek about Melchizedek. And we don't learn any of the, his history. But, but obviously the people around them knew who he was. And, and, uh, and I, go, I think that goes back to, to the, I think Rudy was talking about it. Uh, Don mentioned it, Ella, I think it came up in yours of the influence of Abram in, in, this, uh, in this part of the world at this time. Uh, Melchizedek was a, um, a, a a a believer in God. He was he was he calls him a priest and a king, and and when he when he talks about it, we'll go back and talk look at his 
blessing, uh, and we'll see uh, that he was definitely a believer in, in God. Um, in, in this pagan world, and, and it, it, it's amazing. That's I believe another reason why why it's enter, it's entered in as a as an interruption is to highlight for us as the readers what the Melchizedek is saying, the blessings that he gives. He said, uh, blessed him saying, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Where have we heard the reference to God and, and heaven and earth? Where have we seen that uh, reference before? Well, certainly back uh, back in creation, at the story of creation. Exactly the point that I, I, I was looking for. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And, and here, um, uh, this is, it seems to be a direct re re a revelation or, or reference to God as the creator. And then in, in verse 20, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. This is not, he's, he's, he's reminding Abram, but, but there's the king of Sodom that, 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 that got scared and ran, or maybe he had reason, maybe it was, it was the only thing that saved his life, but he, he, had, he went and ran, and now he's coming to, to thank uh, Abram for but uh, Melchizedek is highlighting that, that it isn't just the work of Abram. It is God who is, the God most high has delivered the enemies into your hand. And so this highlighting this important uh, blessing is why Moses interrupted the conversation. Um, so Harold, do you mind if I just ask you a question here? Because I don't, this is a thought that just came to my mind, and I do not, in front of me, have a map. But how far away was where Jerusalem was and this area? And what was Melchizedek, unless he had been told by God what was going to happen, what had happened, why was he all the way down there? I did not... Um, I, I did not... Do you any reference to study to see where Salem is in relation to this valley of Sheva, which is where the king of Sodom met uh, Abram? I, I think there's some mileage between uh, Salem, which is, of course, where Jerusalem was, right, and this area here. And he shows up, and he shows up before the 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 king of Sodom comes comes up. Well, he doesn't. The king of Sodom is, is introduced in, in verse 17, and then Melchizedek in verse 18. The conversation didn't take place between the king of Sodom and, um, and, and, and Abram until after Melchizedek. So it's, it's that interruption that I was highlighting. And I think it's to, to, to highlight the, these points. Uh, if, if, we, if he had he handled Melchizedek totally, or, and then, then the king of Sodom, or if he had got done it in the other order, we would have just followed the story. But if the fact that there's an interruption is, is, is I think, uh, to, to catch our attention. Um, and uh, so anyway, then there's a third point that I think that, that is there, again, to highlight the recognition of, of, of who God is to the king of Sodom. Uh, and, and, and the king of Sodom was there and observed the, the worship service because they had a worship service. They, 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 they celebrated, um, uh, uh, you know, Abram gave a tithe of, 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 of all that it was gained to, the, to Melchizedek and, and and the, the, the fact that the tithing has been a, a part of, 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 of things since creation. And we uh, also can look at uh, uh, later on that uh, in Jacob, if you look at Genesis 28, verse 22, 
uh, when when Jacob was um, um, uh, he he also gave a tithe. If you read the here and the and the, he he uh, made a remember when when he slept and he had the ladder come down and he woke up and he said and this stone which I've set as a pillar shall be God's house and all that you give me I will surely give a tenth to you. So uh, Jacob is uh, it's. It's not like these are new things, either in Abram's life or in Jacob's life. This is a, a, a already a, an established event of giving tithe. And, and so I think uh, this highlights all of that. So we, who was Melchizedek? Well, let's talk about it in just a minute. He was a king of Salem. He was a priest. Uh, where did he learn about God? in this this we don't know we, you know we can we can uh make all kinds of guesses as to but we do, we're not given that information um you know god had his people uh and, and, and all through uh and rudy that's something you mentioned in, in your part uh, that god had his people throughout the ages even within canaan and he was working on uh, on people's lives um and and so i think that this is evidence of that in, in, in melchizedek uh there are people that try to uh, assign all kinds of things to him but in the life of abram uh, i believe that abram knew who melchizedek was as well you know i, I, I it wasn't like uh, and he had to introduce himself and say I, i'm a priest i'm, I'm king of salem I think they probably had met and, and, and maybe had conversations and, 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 and maybe even worshiped together. I don't know. It doesn't say it here, but um, uh, it, it's clearly that they worship uh, uh, the, the, the most high God and, 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 um, and, and be able, were able to witness to, to the nations around. The king of Sodom, I'm sure, uh, was able to uh, see the evidence of God. Now, we have Melchizedek showing up in, in Hebrews and throughout the, the scripture as, as there have been spiritual um, lessons drawn from, from his life. And, and, and we don't want to mix up at this point, Melchizedek is a person that worships God and, and, and the, the spiritual lessons come in and we learn, can learn a lot. Um, we can learn in, in this whole story about the tithing, about our influence. We were talking about um, some of the things as we look at this lesson in total. Um, we see Abram having faith to leave. He had faith. He, 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 but then we see Abram falling down and not having the faith when he went into Egypt. And then we see Abram coming back and, he, and his faith is strong as he's able to lead this uh, army and, 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 and rescue Lot. And as we'll see in, in next week, Abram fell again and, and, and he uh, uh, fell a, a, a couple number of times, but he keeps coming back. And it seems like we'll, we'll find as we uh, close this in the life later on the life of Abram, that his faith is super strong, and, and so we see this growing. What a what a, a lesson for us today. We 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 do the same thing. We 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 have times when we're we're up, and we're strong, and we're, and then then what happens? Then we get beat up. <laughs> and we 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 actually. Uh, you, you made it sound like it's totally somebody else's fault, but we, 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 we allow it to happen, don't we? Mm -hmm. and, and as, as we saw in Abraham's life, and, and, and we don't need to give up because we can see in the life of Abraham that God kept working with him and he gets stronger and stronger. And, and that's, that was something that we, uh, important. We also, your, your, your text, Rudy, in Second Timothy, where even when we're faithless, God is faithful. You know, I think that's a, a lesson that we see throughout this. That we can see God working. 
um, and we, we we can move on with that. Uh, Ella, you you made some points here, and then tying it into Matthew five and the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the meek, and we see Abram here because we come back to the in in Genesis of fourteen that when when the king of Sodom said, just give me the people, and you take the goods for yourself. You, you just take it all. And what did what was Abram's response? Well, he had promised God he would take nothing. He, he, he said, I'm going to take nothing. He, he was humble. He, 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 uh, he didn't want anyone to look and, and say, yeah, Abraham did this, but look what he got out of it. He, he made himself either, uh, you know, a rich man, the rich get richer. So you know, it's like Satan's accusation against Job. You put your he hedge of protection around him. Why wouldn't he serve you? Well, Abraham is not gaining anything from this. Um, just serving uh, the God uh, the best we can. We also, the, 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 the verse, you are the light of the world. Now, Abraham was being a light. And he was being a very bright light at this point as a witness to the king of Sodom, to the other people that were watching. And, and uh, again, God was working on their hearts all through this. And we had learned the lessons this week about the importance of tithing. Um, it, it, it started back at, at creation, you know, in, in, in Eden. God talked to Abe, no doubt we don't have evidence of it, by God's word saying, but we see that they, it was an, a, an established event, the tithing system uh, here in Abram's time, and, and uh, people understood it. Uh, so we too are part of the, that, the God's blessing. But the tithing is actually different than, than, than just giving of offerings. Uh, it, it, is, it, it is actually God's saying, this is mine. I, I created it. I made it. I gave it to you to, as, as a uh, steward of, of the things. And, and, and I can bless you for having faith uh, and, and, and returning in this time. So it's, it's an, a lesson that we can learn here with uh, Abraham and Melchizedek. And so we can, there's so many things that we can apply to our lives and put our put faith in God. And, I, and my prayer is that, that we will uh, do that day by day and that we'll keep growing uh, even when we fall and we can start to get back up and, and strengthen our faith in God. And so let's, let's bow our heads and thank the Lord for this lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have these stories that we can come to and we can see how you uh, worked with Abram and, and guided him and you you were faithful to him even when when he was faithless uh, and and messed up and we can also apply that to our own lives and we thank you for your promise to be with us we thank you that you you give us the stories to strengthen us to bring us closer to you that we can focus our lives on, on, on when we won't be wandering here on this earth, but we can be stable and in your, your uh, uh, in the heaven with you and, and ha have a, a look forward to eternity with this, with the stable and, and strong life that you would want to give us. And we thank you for that in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. We've run out of time here. I know it, it seems like uh, time goes by fast when we're having these discussions and this study, but uh, uh, time has flown by. And I want to thank all of you for your input and for your, uh, and, and for your teaching uh, of this lesson. Uh, those of you watching and learning with us, uh, we, we want you to be uh, uh, motivated to take some of the ideas we've talked about and continue to study over the coming week so you can bring your own perspective to the Sabbath school class at your church next Sabbath. Uh, you know, drop us a line, let us know what you think about these classes. Uh, we're constantly looking to improve. Your feedback is really important to us. And if you decide that you'd like to join us uh, live on Friday evenings, 
just uh, uh, go, send an email uh, on reach out for food at gmail.com and we will send you a Zoom invitation and tell you everything you need to know. Until then, uh, please pray for this program. Have a safe and blessed Sabbath. And by all means, remember God loves you. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Thank you.